Hey, Megan, I can't share my video. Oh, just one moment. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining um, today's Critical Access Hospital Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. Um, this is the Region C Conference uh, sponsored by Stroudwater Associates. Um, so as we get started today, where I'm going to work on trying to get my video on here, um, and just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Um, uh, everyone's going to be muted uh, automatically as you join. If you need to ask a question, there is the chat box function that you can utilize, as well as the Q&A feature down here at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom link. Um, all sessions will be recorded, and slides will, and recordings will also be available to folks that have registered um, following today's webinar. After today's um, webinar and, and conference, um, after the last session uh, this morning, um, you will be receiving a short survey. Um, we would really appreciate if you take a little bit of time just to uh, fill that survey out about today's conference. It should pop up in your browser as you close out of Zoom after today's session. Um, a little bit about Stroudwater Associates. We've been a, a healthcare consulting for a uh, consulting firm for 37 years. Um, we have uh, really supported rural hospitals and critical access hospitals all across the country, doing a lot of um, strategy and operational improvement um, throughout the U.S. So he, this just is a ge geographical representation of many of our clients since 2017, uh, just to kind of give you a flavor of, of where we've worked over the last several years. Um, and we're also... Um, uh, a proud and um, um, really able to help uh, our hospitals around capital funding and support around the USDA grant program. Um, we have a recent subsidiary called Stroudwater Capital Partners that helps um, our rural hospitals and um, facilities and organizations really access some some funding uh, through various um, loan payment programs. So you can see that they have worked with um, numerous um, uh, facilities across the country as well. So with that, I am going to get started um, and we're going to talk a little bit about health equity. Um, and really around the importance of data collection specifically. Um, so my name is Lindsay Corcoran. I'm a senior consultant at Stroudwater Associates, and um, I'm really happy to be with you today. So he, as you are well aware, um, certainly as, as even just being in a rural community, we, we, we really face kind of a disproportionate social and economic disparities um, compared to urban care center, settings. And um, leveraging data is really at the root and is so vital to be able to identify um, healthcare disparities and start to reduce and improve um, health around among our rural communities. So for today, we're gonna really talk about kind of the importance of health equity and social determinants of health data. And then how can this data uh, really, how can we leverage this data? What are some kind of foundational building blocks um, that we need to implement at our organizations to really help um, support a health equity strategy. So why does health equity data um, really matter? Um, if we don't measure, if we don't collect, if we don't um, start to stratify, stratify or, or differentiate any type of data, um, we, will, we will overlook um, disparities in health and healthcare. Um, we we will not be able to understand where there may be gaps. Um, and really looking at healthcare data by race, ethnicity, language, uh, various demographic factors such as age, sex, health literacy, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, is really vital for understanding and, and addressing those health disparities. Um, and, and certainly we often underestimate um, the magnitude of disparity and we overlook them um, and we, we may overlook certain patient populations and really just maybe unaware of some of the barriers that patients um, and our community members face. So unless we closely examine and stratify health data, 
um, that is going to only the that is the best way that we can start to understand and kind of grasp the disparities that are um, within our communities and start to strategize, start to whether it's allocate resources um, to different um, interventions or strategies or really just to understand um, where, where we should be focusing our efforts. Um, as you may have heard that certainly um, the, the federal side um, of healthcare is, is certainly in support of, of improving health equity. Um, CMS has recently come out with health equity quality measures. Um, they call this the, the hospital commitment to health equity. And this is actually a, um, PPS related quality measures through the inpatient quality reporting program, but as critical access hospitals, I, I strongly suggest that we are aware. We are aware of these measures, but we're also aware because it really outlines a really nice kind of um, commitment to health equity as it relates to a hospital and things that we should as critical access hospitals really be thinking about. And so within this measure um, on the hospital's commitment to establishing a culture of equity, it's really looking at uh, attesting to five different domains um, it, within this inpatient quality reporting program measure. Uh, ones are around strategic planning, data collection, data analytics, quality improvement, and leadership engagement. Um, and then there's also a few other measures that are also included um, in the CMS health equity quality measures around um, capturing, screening, and identifying um, health-related social needs of our patients and really understanding food insecurity, housing, instability, um, transportation needs, utility difficulties, and interpersonal safety. So really important, again, for, even as though as this is, kind of, is a PBS-focused measure, Critical access hospitals should really look at what they are doing in this space to really start to, um, you know, Im implement screening mechanisms. Um, and then again, what do you do with the data? That's always a, a big question. Yes, we may screen, but what do we do after the fact? Um, I just want to briefly just share a little bit about the two domains that are really relative to data collection because it really breaks um, the the measures down a little bit about specific actions that the hospital should be able, should attest to, or should be really looking at to be able to meet these, these different domains here. Um, and, you know, Desir, and then as I'm saying this, you know, kind of think about your own hospital and your organization. Does, does your hospital collect demographic information, including self-reported race and ethnicity or social determinants of health information on the majority of patients? Um, can you say, can you kind of check the box there and that you are doing that? Do you have training for your staff in culturally, culturally sensitive collection of demographics and or social determinants of health information? Do we provide that staff education? And do you input that demographic, the social determinants of health information into a, um, a certified EHR technology? Uh, something that is certainly vital for being able to abstract uh, data and information, um, that it's not just collected on um, paper forms that are scanned in, that this is actually um, put into um, a, a certified EHR technology. And then on the other side of this is the, the next domain is around data analysis. So does our hospital stratify key performance indicators by demographics or social determinants of health? Again, um, really looking at um, these, you know, the, the KPRs, the indicators by and stratifying that really um, meets that that domain number three around data analysis. Do we put this information on hospital performance dashboards? And what I like about this part of it is that when we similar, very much in line with maybe our, our quality folks that have quality dashboards or, or revenue cycle folks that have KPI dashboards um, specific to revenue cycle, if we put health equity related measures on a hospital performance dashboard, we're really starting to put it at the forefront. You know, we are looking at these measures, we're looking at our data, and we're really continuing to monitor and track um, our activity as it relates to health equity and some of these um, health, health, social determinants of health um, 
uh, information here. So in doing, um, in really kind of looking at um, the, these two domains and then and then really in concert with the other three domains really starts to advance um, an organization's commitment to health equity. And for folks that may be with um, a joint commission accredited hospital, you know, certainly the joint commission, um, you know, effective January 1st of 2023 um, have developed um, elements of performance related to reducing healthcare disparities. And you can certainly see that there's very, um, you know, looking at screening uh, for patients and self-related um, uh, social needs, as well as, you know, the social determinants of health, identifying um, healthcare disparities by stratifying quality and safety data. Again, uh, elements within the elements of performance really support data collection and data analysis. So very important as, in, you know, and Joint Commission has also put out a accreditation program um, as well as it relates to health equity. So if folks are um, interested in that. So certainly when we think about it, you know, there's lots of support that's happening. Um, measures related to advancing health equity at the at your hospital system, you know, and I think very vital for, for critical access hospitals to really start to look at what are we doing in our organization as it relates to um, the various measures that CMS and Joint Commission have put out um, and really starting to kind of self-assess where you are. But, you know, if, it, you know, data collection is, is really at the core of advancing health equity. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, understanding those health disparities um, really supports the, the triple aim. So, so IHI's triple aim around improving the patient experience, um, improving the health of populations and really reducing um, the cost of healthcare. Um, you know, one thing that we can really do, and I'm, I'm going to really stress on the importance of, and, and as a component of data collection and um, data analysis, is querying and stratifying. So asking your data questions and stratifying or differentiating the data sets. So you may look at a, and so what that means, kind of an example of what that means is you may uh, look at your Health, health data, and you want to look at the Hispanic population um, and heart disease, or maybe um, information related to high school education attainment and diabetes management. So really kind of querying that data, asking the data different questions, and then really starting to stratify or differentiate uh, um, against uh, various uh, variables. And then also, if, if able, um, a, a way to really uh, understand vulnerable populations within your community is to actually be able to map data. Um, mapping or creating some type of visualization really um, is, is really kind of highlights maybe neighborhoods, uh, communities that may have a higher prevalence of a disease or, you know, um, certainly highlights where maybe those vulnerable populations exist from a mapping or a visualist, uh, visualization uh, standpoint. But certainly with any type of data collection, um, there is barriers to data collection and use. And, you know, uh, being in rural is certainly a barrier. Um, one in, you know, in rural, we tend to have smaller, smaller data sets, smaller numbers, um, and often what we're seeing right now is that actually data is um, being suppressed. So if you are able to obtain data at a zip code level, you may only um, see, you know, five or 10 cases. And I think on uh, CMS is actually suppressing any, any number of cases less than seven. So, you know, again, if you don't have the data, how are you able to really start to um, uh, graphs different healthcare disparities without the information. Um, in addition, you know, um, from a on a hospital or organizational level, we may have a lack of staff understanding about why data is collected, um, a staff discomfort around data collection. There um, is certainly uh, IT limitations. 
So, you know, we have limitations within our own EHR, um, the ability to abstract information or pull reports or do any type of data analysis is difficult on certain, you know, systems. Uh, we have systems that, that don't talk. So we have impartial data sets. Um, and we have this lack of standardization around um, the, the different categories of information that we're collecting. And then certainly we have uh, patient privacy concerns or concerns around um, uh, giving out health related data to uh, organizations or people. So what are some ways that we can start to standardize an approach? Um, we can start to look at developing a data collection framework for our organization. And this framework is really, um, uh, really, it allows organizations to kind of systematically collect demographic data um, from patients or caregivers. And so having a, in developing and implementing a, a standardized framework for data collection really helps um, to uh, collect more accurate and complete data. So the American Hospital Association's Institute for Diversity and Inclusion um, has kind of laid out some of these key components of uh, the data collection framework. Um, so one being, we need to de develop a rationale of why the patient is being asked to provide this information. Very standardized approach. Um, a script to really support our staff um, in, in a, you know, asking the patient for this information, but also to um, make sure that it is being articulated in a very standardized approach. So again, um, having you know uh, more of a standardization to our data collection, again, helps with complete and more accurate data sets. Um, allowing a method for patients to self-report. And so, you know, certainly this also touches on privacy concerns or barriers because of privacy concerns of patients. Um, if they are able to maybe use a their phone or a tablet something that they can, and they don't have to verbalize or self-report verbally, you may um, have better, um, better success at, at collecting health-related um, information and data from a patient if they're able to self-report. So kind of thinking about ways that you connect and, and collect patient uh, information. And then um, making sure that we have assurances in place that this data is gonna be held confidentially. And um, certainly that, you know, uh, and again, this really kind of hones in on the privacy um, related to um, keeping information safe. And then um, at the, the back end is how we have standardized an approach for really kind of rolling up our, um, our responses or our health related data for different analytical purposes and reporting purposes. And we'd like to utilize the US Office of Management and budget categories around race and ethnicity. Um, so again, very much standardized approach um, it would be a best practice there. And then when you think about the analytics side, so we've collected the data and now we're here, we're gonna, we're gonna how start to analyze um, some of the information and develop a data infrastructure at your organization is something that's so vital that really needs to be supported and promoted at the leadership level. Um, we do have a lot of hospitals that are really um, putting uh, data, uh, developing a data infrastructure for their organization at the forefront of, of their, their mission and their strategy. And starting increasingly, we're hearing more, um, you know, positions open around data anal analytics and population health data um, infrastructures and looking at hiring somebody that has experience in predictive analytics. Again, uh, movement in, into developing a data infrastructure is going to really help support how we can analyze our health related information and really understand those disparities that may exist in our community. Um, one thing that we need to really do is make sure that we provide staff training and support in obtaining accurate data um, and assess the accuracy of, of our data. Because we know that likely um, we may have inaccurate information that comes in. Um, and so certainly, 
some ways to assess the accuracy of our data, we may observe patients. How well do our patients understand what's being asked of them? Um, and we may observe our staff. How well do staff present or request the, the information or request the um, information from the patients? And so kind of maybe making some of those observations. Um, look to char characterize missing data. Of, we will likely, you know, in every healthcare organizations, we will have missing data. Um, and, and certainly if you have low rates of missing data, you know, that might, that might be okay. But if you have higher rates of missing data that you're seeing gaps, that certainly can really increase questioning the data, the validity of the data, and certainly can impact kind of our improvement efforts, our strategy development around health equity. So we really want to try to um, minimize any type of, of um, the missing data. And then certainly um, articulate the reasons why we stratify the data. Um, why are understand, you know, why are we doing um, what, what we're doing? What is our mission around um, health related data? With any organization, we have internal data sets, we have external data sets. Um, and you can see, you know, certainly referral information, clinical outcomes. Um, on the external side, we have health information exchange and claims data. We have various data sets. I'm sure you can list off uh, data sets that you tap into at your organization. But what I like to say is utilize the data that you have and get the data you need. Um, one uh, nice data set around health um, social determinants of health is the use of Z codes. So very important for organizations to, as you are doing your screening and identifying various health-related social needs or social determinants of health, make sure that we are coding and documenting those ICD-10 Z codes. Um, certainly are um, very, very beneficial, not only to be able to pull that information from uh, your internal data sets, but this is claims data. This goes to our federal government. This goes to, um, uh, you know, and our federal government is the one who's doing grant planning and funding. And, you know, if they don't know what problems exist um, as it relates to some of the social determinants of health in our communities, um, you know, there's less, less likely to be able to support some of that from the, the funding mechanisms. Um, Querying. So again, querying is really around asking your data the right questions. It will really start to give you insights into um, social determinants of health of your patients and your hospitals and your community. And there's two different examples around um, querying, um, querying your data set. There's process queries, so really the treatment procedure encounter. So you may have a percentage of white male patients um, uh, who had a colonoscopy by ethnicity, or an outcome um, example might be ethnicity breakdown of patients who suffered a fall during the inpatient stay. So again, really asking your data um, the various questions. And then really just kind of tying it and bringing it all back together is identify, um, do not rely on the assumptions about the health equities that exist in your community. And, you know, certainly we may have um, your health equities in your community certainly may differ from national or state databases. So you may be pulling, you know, state data or county level data, but is it really the truly what is happening in your community? Um, and so I would like to say utilize the best available data that you have to understand kind of what's happening in your, in your community. Um, and really start to gain a comprehensive understanding of identified health equities and look at multiple aspects of health in your community. Um, so don't just, it's not a one size fits all model. It's really pulling in various data sources um, to really look at um, uh, uh, your health disparities and really start to understand health disparities um, within your community look at different uh, tools to identify health inequities. And so some of those tools um, that you may leverage today might be national databases. You might get information from your health department. Um, universities uh, have, you know, 
data, data sets, they do a data analysis, but is there other data sets that maybe you haven't thought of and maybe that you could tap into when you start to look at data collection um, as it relates to patients' needs in your community? Um, some of those might be uh, the public works department, um, transportation groups, uh, police departments. Um, they all have access to other data sources as well. So it really starts to kind of, you can really start to consider expanding data um, collection and data sources. So, you know, certainly, you know, public works might be looking at water quality or transportation issues or street conditions. Um, you might be able to pull crime statistics, you know, again, um, uh, use a, a alternative or additional um, tools to identify some of those health equities. And then certainly one thing that we can't do is we can't do it alone. Um, you're probably like thinking, oh my goodness, this seems very overwhelming. This is a lot. Um, when you think about data collection, it, it, you know, why not maybe engage community members in data collection um, and in, in, data, in data interpretation? Um, maybe provide some, some training to your community members. Um, maybe they go and do a walking um, data collection or... Um, Again, engage folks, collaborate with folks to really help support um, reducing healthcare disparities within your communities. And then what certainly gets measured gets improved. So then really, you know, at the back end is really starting to tie all of this together. Um, you know, foundationally data, data collection, data use, data analysis is at the, the, the real heart of how we start to develop um, the, the strategy around improving health equity. And I, I do have to say, you know, health equity is a journey. Um, cert certainly every organization is at a different part of this health equity journey. The American Hospital Association created this continuum here. Um, and every healthcare organization could be somewhere across this continuum. So I want to make sure that, you know, you, you're thinking, well, you know, we might just be in the exploring stage. We're just, we're just maybe scratching the surface on talking about health equity and understanding maybe what are the resources we need to commit to our health equity journey. But then we may have some organizations that are in the transforming stage they have um, developed the strategy, they're executing on the strategy, and now they're just really wondering to, to really understand how do we as sustain um, an, an equitable system of healthcare within our community. And then certainly, you know, as we um, um, really developing that comprehensive health strategy is really around identifying, addressing um, our social determinants of health, within our communities, um, things that are impacting our patient population. And we have to remember that data collection for health equity is an ongoing process. Um, I do wanna stress that, you know, thinking about reassessing what your data needs are, modifying your data collection methods if, if, if needed, um, and then continuously refine data collection in, an, in the analysis process. It is a journey, it is a process, and it's something that, you know, we, we need to, to be comfortable doing um, and, and really maybe expand and tap into additional resources if we need to, um, collaborate with other organizations on data collection and data use, um, because again, we can't do this in, in a vacuum, in a silo, um, because we, we won't be successful in that in that journey. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, certainly COVID really pushed us um, into uh, creating this public awareness of, of racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare um, and utilizing data to, to really start to ex look at and understand those healthcare disparities um, is, is really at the forefront here. And so we need to kind of really start to measure and stratify and query our different data sets to be able to understand um, where there are disparities in healthcare and you know certainly start to improve 
and advance health equity for our, our communities and organizations. So with that, I do have some time for questions um, before our next presenter joins. Okay. Hey, Lindsay, we did get one question in. Um, so, so as a critical access hospital, we are data rich, but we don't know where to start. What would you say would be the best way to start looking at our patient level data? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so lots of organizations, a good way to start maybe would be looking at your community health needs assessment. You know, certainly that is a, a, a document, a exercise that has not typically been leveraged um, as best as it should be for health equity strategy. Um, and so looking at the data that's collected there um, and seeing how it compares to your internal information as well. Um, and then, you know, looking at your ED utilization, um, typically what, um, you know, looking at maybe high utilizers in the ED or what, does the hospital want to address? Um, do you want to address outcomes? Do you want to address access issues or social determinants of health? And really kind of understanding what the core strategy is of the organization and then utilizing maybe information specifically from a department like the emergency department and focusing on that area or leveraging, you know, your community health needs assessment. Um, and certainly make sure that your data is accurate. Um, and at, continue asking your data different questions. What do you want to see out of your data? So hopefully that was helpful. All right, with that, I am going to um, switch gears and we are going to introduce our next presenter um, as I end and stop my slideshow here. Um, we have uh, our, our next presenter here is Opal Greenwood. Um, and she is joined by Stacy Gerber Ward, and they're going to be talking about compensation. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I am getting my screen share going. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Opal Greenway with Principal at Stroudwater who leads our position advisory team. And I'm so excited to have Stacey Gerber Ward, an attorney at Von Brees and Roper that I have met over the years and have, um, we've been working on a fun project. I use the word, a very interesting project over the, um, the past year that we'd like to share with you. And it really goes at the heart of what really boards need to know. Um, and when it comes with dealing with provider compensation, this is not just a C-suite thing. And then also hopefully when we go over this case study with you, everybody will be able to get a little bit of a better understanding also is if you are a C-suite person, how to engage with your board and think about overall compensation strategy. So today we'd like to talk to you a little bit about the client that we have been working with and how we went about actually educating the board well and what the overall compensation strategy process is and kind of some of the outcomes that we saw throughout the, um, this process. So again, thank you, Stacey, for joining me. So setting, yep, so setting um, a good, we um, have, we're talking about hospital payday here, um, a client that we have worked with, and hospital payday reached out to us, and they were very interested in adopting a new compensation strategy for their organization. They didn't really have one. They didn't have some uniform vision of how to address compensation for their providers, rather their physicians or their advanced practice providers. So they really wanted, okay, what is an overarching strategy that we can employ anytime we hire a provider and anytime we need to look at contracts? We thought they thought it would really streamline their ability to do negotiations and have that. They actually had a relatively new C-suite. They've had some turnover um, based off of some retirements. And so this was also an opportunity for um, the new CEO and the rest of the C-suite to be able to, how did they want to do things and work with their providers going forward and really establish that. So in coming up with what the engagement was going to cover, they wanted to make sure they recognized that they were going to start employing some um, um, specialties such as CRNAs that they had never employed before. 
they wanted to make sure that there was a balance of organizational needs, but also making sure they're high, they're competitive, um, given the supply and demand of providers out there. It needed to be fair. There needed to be some merit-based incentive in there. So how can we start incorporating productivity incentives that they had never had before for really some of their high performers? Um, recognizing that they wanted to make sure we took in um, consideration of their overall benefits package as part of total remuneration, recognizing that as a benefits package, they didn't know how competitive they were, how generous they were, and we should be looking at total remuneration, especially in today's landscape where providers care a lot more about what is that benefits package. It's not just all about the cash compensation. It's, it's PTO, it's life balance, it's you know, retirement funds and student loan. Um, in this case, this the providers were very interested during the pandemic. They had been given access to having lunch, um, access to lunch at the cafeteria every single day on the hospital. And that was something that, hey, we started in the pandemic. We should continue this going forward. Um, that any provider could go in and actually have a um, basically a lunch stipend. There were things that were unique about their community that they wanted to make sure that we could address provider expectations and demand. And also, they really wanted to know what was best practice in the industry. Since they didn't have an overall compensation strategy historically, they really wanted to make sure, well, what's out there? We've been living in our own little bubble for such a long time. You know, are there best ways of doing this as a critical access hospital? What's unique about a critical access hospital about how compensation needs to work for us? They did want to make sure that they were meeting compliance requirements. And also, they wanted to make sure there was consistency. Um, since they didn't have an overarching strategy historically, all of their contracts were very much one-offs. Um, while Stacy had worked with them historically to work on a contract template, all the end um, there was free reign for negotiation. So there was a lot of um, differences. Once once Stacy handed them over to the template, there was a lot of editing that was going on. I would say. Um, on on their side of things. So not not a ton of consistency between the provider employment contracts. So we started this engagement, very excited to work with them on their compensation strategy. And, you know, as I mentioned, there really hadn't been any sort of consistent methodology and really logic applied to it. The logic historically had very much been providers would come in and say, here's the top market rate. This is what I want. And so, and they would, that's what they got. Um, you know, very, very um, skilled negotiators as far as the providers were in negotiating their compensation. And one of the things that con the consequence of that is there was really no connection between the compensation itself and the level of work that they needed to provide. So there was no marrying between what those expectations were. It was whatever compensation you came in and negotiate at the time. They did do um, historically some pay equity things. So if they gave, if they brought somebody in at a higher rate that was outside of what everybody else might be paying, they're like, oh, there's a market movement. We should update a compensation for that market so that everybody's treated fairly. But there, uh, again, it didn't necessarily acknowledge the differences in between what people were providing, how many shifts they were taking if they were in ED or a hospitalist, how many patients they were seeing if they were in the primary care clinic. Um, how many people were actually providing coverage at a single time. So if you were anesthesiology, you could be one provider um, and you got the same pay versus if there were two of you on staff at the same time, even with the same volume of surgeries going on. So when we did that, we recognized that there were some difficult, you know, when you have that much disparity across, there's some difficulties that come up with how do you come up with a unifying strategy that is also going to be financially sustainable and not going to cause a mass exodus. So as we're going through this, what do you do when you come up with that? You all um, and you know that you want to be with industry best practices and also compliance. You call legal. So we called up um, we called up Stacy and we very much wanted to get her involved because there were very much things that were going on that we felt. This is this is board level. This is not just hey, a, you know, a CEO should really just come at it with you know a red pen and say here's how it's going to be. The board really needed to be educated as to what was going on and you know figuring out how did what role did they need to have going forward in this to make sure that everything we were doing was compliant. So, Stacey, anything you want to add about about how you got involved in the overall? overview of the project. Yeah, I, you know, the one thing I would add, Opal, is um, I think historically what the client 
was relying on was just survey data um, without any expert advice about the how that survey data matched up with what their providers were doing on the ground or how it compared with really their peers. And so um, it was, I think, really, um, uh, that was really important is to incorporate some expert opinion on what that survey data meant and not just relying on the survey data. I mean, I, I would say this is um, a challenge we often see with smaller providers. They think, oh, we can just do this with survey data. This is all we need. Um, and then the other piece I would just mention here is the board's involvement was really important because uh, looking at the all of the facts and circumstances here, right? There needed to be significant changes to their compensation structure and not just tweaks, right? So the board involvement, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of the regulatory risks in a minute, but um, uh, the board in, uh, involvement in this process, because it was going to involve so many uh, significant changes to how they were compensating providers was really important. Yeah, I I, th I, I agree with you, Stacey. I think that with um, any time, even if you're having some small tweaks, if you if the board is already familiar with a compensation strategy that you have that you are adjusting, it's very different than we've never had a strategy before, you know, and the board recognizing, okay, if we're going to have a strategy, anything that is truly strategic, we always recommend that the board has some involvement, right? That is the board's role is to set the strategy for the organization. And really best practice is marrying organizational strategy with compensation strategy. Um, well, sorry, the reverse of that, making sure compensation aligns with organizational strategy. Because keep in mind, compensation at the end of the day, it's what you pay people to do what you want them to do. And so if there's if those two things are not aligned, if they're completely divorced and not looked at together, then how do you know that what you're paying people to do actually is going to move the strategy for the organization forward is a really big thing. So we decided we, we basically needed to make sure the board was educated on what was going on. And there were a couple of things that the board needed to know. They needed to understand really that provider remuneration, it, I mean, this was their biggest expense on their PL. That usually is the number one expense for most organizations is what are you paying the providers? It's going, it's a significant expense and it's going to be increasing. And if you're coming out of the pandemic, had any sort of financial distress, this is it's an it's a line item on the PL you can't afford to ignore and what's going on on that, especially since the market data is also increasingly available to providers. So as Stacy had mentioned, there's AMG out there, there's MGMA, there's all these different surveys. And providers talk. They very much talk. They're like, I well, I heard, you know, provider who lives two hours away that I knew know um, is getting paid this much. That's what I want too. Recognizing though, as Stacey was talking about, is that survey data is just that it you could be comparing apples to armchairs for all you know, right? If you don't understand the information and the situations around how that compensation is determined, because MGMA, which is one that we use frequently, reports total cash compensation. They don't say what portion of this compensation is associated with medical directorship, what portion of this is productivity, what portion of this might be a sign-on bonus um, or a retention bonus. And so they just if people just report total cash compensation, a sign-on bonus is a great example. Somebody might get a $100,000 sign-on bonus that for a five-year term. Well, from a fair market value situation, which we, we usually spread that out over five years, even if they get the check all in year one. And so when somebody reports, keep in mind, all these surveys are self-reporting. A practice administrator is spending six hours responding to 200 questions on MGMA of, here's what I paid this provider last year on their W-2. Well, if they got that full on sign-on bonus, sign bonus that year, their W-2 might be $100,000 more than what it would be on any other year. And so if you don't fully understand the data you're looking at and understanding how to normalize it, including what were the services provided. So when a provider comes to us and says, well, I heard so-and-so down the street is making X, that's what I want. Do you know what their responsibilities are? Do you know how many patients they're seeing? Do you know what additional support they have? Are they running the emergency room by themselves? Or are there three providers there at the same time? So understanding all those different pieces when market data 
and incomplete market data is increasingly available to providers is really important for the boards to understand that because keep in mind with a critical access hospital, we see our board members at the grocery store, at PTA, on the soccer field all the time. The providers have access to their board members in a way that we don't see in large academic medical centers necessarily, right? These are people that they are friends with, that they go and have a beer with after work. And so you need to make sure your board is really, really educated as to what is going on in order for them to make sure that they can put on their hats appropriately when communicating with providers. Because I'm sure many people on this um, at our conference this year can say, oh yes, a provider was unhappy with me as a CEO and they went directly to a board member and talked about it. Um, that, that happens at critical access hospitals every single day of the week, I'm sure. On top of that, we know that boards really need to understand that Provider remuneration is highly regulated. And Stacey's going to go into the regulations um, a little bit here in a second. So you need to know the rule. It's not just that it is regulated. You need to know the rules and how they apply to you so that you can understand what your risk is. And on top of that, things are changing really, really fast. We've had so many different changes that have impacted provider compensation in the past three years. I have been doing this for almost 15 years. In the past three years, I've had more changes than all of that combined as far as what we've seen as things moving fast. The physician fee schedule you had happen, you had COVID happen, um, you have increasing market data that has been happening and, and then the financial pieces, not to mention mass exodus of providers from the healthcare workforce, which is creating supply and demand issues. And then Austin, one of the things that we'll get into is the boards need to understand what, how does this impact operations? Right, there's some significant operational changes that can happen as a result of how you treat compensation. So understanding how those things marry to one another is really, really important to understanding, okay, if we make this decision, what does that do to operations? Is that going to be okay? What is going to be the financial impact of doing that? You know, is it going to mean we're going to have to build things differently? Do we need different nursing staff, et cetera? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacey. Could you talk to us a little bit about some of the board education that you had provided um, and also the rules that apply for these situations? Sure, absolutely. I, and one on the previous slide, I just wanted to throw in one other comment. You know, the board, it's really important to keep in mind that the every board member has a fiduciary obligation to the organization, right? So that fiduciary obligation includes the board providing oversight of the hospital's regulatory compliance. And so while many, you know, a lot of board members may be very skilled business people from the community, and maybe you have some healthcare providers, right? This is generally your board members don't have a lot of legal background in terms of the regulatory framework um, that governs uh, uh, the hospital and specifically governs provider compensation. Um, and so I, I would say just from the board's fiduciary obligation, right, it's really important for them to understand these issues and provide oversight regarding the organization's uh, regulatory compliance. And I would say it's really important to note that the enforcement authorities, and in this case, primarily the U.S. Department of Justice, really expects boards to be educated on their fiduciary obligations uh, to oversee regulatory compliance, um, and to exercise that oversight of the hospital's compliance program. So this is an expectation, right? The board members each have their own individual fiduciary obligation to the organization, but then there's sort of the expectation of the, of the enforcement agencies that are out there regarding the board's role in this. Um, so it's really important to provide this, to provide education to your board regarding the regulatory environment. And, um, you know, I think, Opal's uh, has made a good point, right? This The education cannot just be one and done. Um, this stuff can be really hard for the layperson. Again, a lot of business leaders, healthcare providers that are on your board, that's fantastic. They provide um, unique uh, skill sets to provide leadership to the organization, um, but they really need some of the legal background. And, and again, this stuff is hard. And so hitting it um, on a regular basis can be helpful. Also keep in mind, you have people rolling on and off your boards, right? So you, while you might have done this training a year ago, um, you might have new board members that rolled onto your board that are gonna need the education. So when so we- I hear, One of the things I hear you saying, Stacey, 
is it doesn't matter whether or not you are the owner of the car dealership or if you are the head of the Department of Education for your community, or if you are actually a physician, the same rules apply as far as what the expectation is of you as a board member. Correct. Correct. And we've got to get everybody, every board member to a point where they can, in good faith, exercise their fiduciary obligations to the organization. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about the regulatory landscape here, um, and I'll start with really the biggie, which is the Stark Law or the um, Physician Self-Referral Law. Um, this is the one that everybody hears about, um, but maybe um, the understanding is, is fairly shallow. So what the Stark Law says is that it prohibits physicians um, from making a referral to uh, uh, for a particular type of health service called a designated health service to an entity with which the physician has a financial relationship. So anytime there's a financial relationship between an entity that's providing certain types of services and a physician, you're not there. Uh, the law prohibits a financial relationship between the physician and that organization. Um, so the types of services that are covered, it's important to note, um, there's a long list of them, but in particular for today's purposes, it includes inpatient admissions. Um, so this is, again, a very broad prohibition, and uh, I'm sure you're wondering, well, golly, in light of how broad it is, how can anybody do business? Well, the way the, the law is set up is that there's a broad prohibition, and then there are very specific exceptions um, that can be complied with in order to have a financial relationship with the physician. So one of those exceptions is um, a, a bona fide employment relationship with your physicians. And what's really important to note about the um, uh, exception for employment relationships is that in order to qualify for the Stark exception for employment relationships, the compensation to the physician has to meet several criteria. One big criteria and why consultants like Stroudwater exist is that that compensation has to be fair market value. Um, in addition, the compensation cannot be based on the value or volume of referrals that the, is paid to, um, um, uh, cannot be based on the value or volume of referrals that are made by the physician to the hospital. And that compensation must be commercially reasonable. In other words, there must be a good business reason for the compensation. So again, there are a lot of regulatory requirements that must be met when determining compensation. And again, the biggest one really is fair market value. Um, what's important, a couple of other important things to know about Stark. First of all, Stark is a civil statute, which means if the, if the statute is violated and the uh, hospital or provider is um, alleged of a violation of that, what the government is trying to do is they're trying to recover money back that was wrongfully paid, right? This is not a criminal statute where somebody's going to jail. That's the next statute I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so it's a civil statute. The other important piece of this is it's a strict liability statute. What does strict liability mean? It means the government doesn't look at the hospital or the physician's intent on entering an agreement that violates Stark to determine whether or not there's liability. If you haven't met the requirements of Stark, uh, of the technical elements, there is a violation of the statute, regardless of what the parties believed or thought they were trying to accomplish by entering in this compensation relationship. Um, so it, it can be harsh. Um, the, the law can be harsh. So, so compliance with it is, is critical for hospitals. The, the second statute that, I, and I'll just mention this briefly, because in this context, it's really just sort of a tag along, is the anti-kickback statute. The anti-kickback statute is a criminal statute rather than a civil statute. And that um, prohibits the paying of remuneration in order to induce referrals of uh, services that are reimbursed by federal health care programs. Um, often violations of the Stark statute are violations of the anti-kickback statute. So they're often violations of one statute are often brought along with the other statute as well. Um, the third important statute just for boards to be aware of is the False Claims Act. The False Claims Act is a civil statute that makes it illegal for a provider to submit false claims to federal health care programs. Um, false claims can be many things. I mean, what we what is the most easy to understand example is a false claim can be submitting a claim for a service that wasn't rendered. 
Um, that again, that's on the easy side. But um, recent um, developments under the False Claims Act have made it clear that if there is a violation of the Stark Law or the anti-kickback statute um, in terms of the compensation relationship with a provider, and then claims for that provider are submitted to the Medicare or Medicaid programs, that can be a violation of the False Claims Act. And the False Claims Act is really significant because it provides for treble damages. So if there are $100,000 in false claims, the liability under the False Claims Act, should a False Claims Act case be brought, is treble damages or $300,000, plus there's a per False Claim Act penalty that's very significant. So the one of the big criticisms of stark enforcement under the False Claims Act is that the damages for an unintentional violation of the law can be very, very significant, especially for a small provider. Um, so the other important thing to know about the False Claims Act is that there are whistleblower provisions. Um, and what that means is that private citizens who become aware that there is potentially a violation of the False Claims Act statute can bring um, a whistleblower action. And basically the, the citizen can stand in the shoes of the government and say, I'm aware that there are false claims being submitted. The government gets a chance to step into that investigation to take a look at it and decide whether or not they wanna take that over and litigate, um, or the whistleblower can litigate on their own. Um, so there's really, a this is a very, this has been a very useful enforcement tool for the federal government. Um, it's actually how I got my education in uh, healthcare fraud enforcement. I did this work on behalf of the government for 15 years before uh, joining, uh, rejoining a law firm back about five years ago. Um, it is really the way that a lot of these enforcement cases come about. And it's important to note that there are many examples of physicians who are unhappy about their new compensation relationships with hospitals becoming the whistleblowers. So this is often the way these uh, enforcement actions come about. The so last- Stacey, oh, go ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt for a second and ask you a question. So since you've just admitted to being on that the other side and doing that kind of enforcement, what were some of the things that you were looking for um, as far as when you were you know, enforcing the Stark Law and looking for, hey, is this a bad agreement? Was this provider paid incorrectly? Um, you know, what were the, what were the things that were trigger warnings for you? Um, I, I mean, it's really fact specific Opal, but I would say, um, um, you know, I, maybe I'll just give a, an example. I can't speak from any cases that I was involved in, but there was a case that occurred after, um, I, um, left the department um, and I wasn't involved in uh, that came down where there was a $20 million settlement regarding a Wisconsin hospital um, for Stark violations. I would say in that case, there was, even though the Stark law is uh, a strict liability statute, there was a um, there was certainly um, an intent to reward uh, uh, providers for their referrals of services. I mean, this was something that was taken into account when the compensation system was set up. Um, and uh, right, these were, it was a situation where uh, health system was competing with larger health systems. They were trying to be competitive in terms of the reimbursement that was being provided to their providers. And in order to, to sort of get into that competitive position, they were looking at the referrals, the historic referral patterns of these providers. Um, so that's a particularly uh, attractive fact pattern for a prosecutor. Um, there were frankly lots of uh, board minutes that documented this and emails and memos um, that are all cited in publicly available um, documents uh, regarding the liability. So, um, Try, again, th these situations where uh, hospitals are in a position to be competitive, uh, especially with bigger rivals that might be coming into their market, are certainly uh, situations that are fraught uh, with risk for smaller providers. Um, the last uh, um, important piece of education for the board are just the IRS rules regarding um, uh, providing compensation. These are referred to as the private inurement rules. So for nonprofit organizations, um, typically uh, your compensation, both your executives and your uh, providers, 
uh, really should be fair market value in order to be able to maintain um, your uh, nonprofit status. So that's an, another important piece of, of board education. So Opal, I can turn it back to you. Yeah, so so as Stacy said, one of the ways that you can make sure you're covered is just pay within fair market value, right? It's simple, just pay whatever, you know what, but what is fair market value and what, what does it look like? Because we mentioned the surveys earlier, and why the surveys can be problematic is if you just say, well, okay, well, MGMA median is this. So how do I, why can't I just pay that? Because that's clearly the market rate. If that's the average compensation that's getting paid nationwide, should, like, let's just pay that. Well, first of all, because MGMA median might not be what's appropriate for your market. There's certain things that the survey data actually does take into consideration. The survey data is actually broken out by specialty and subspecialty. So that might be in there. We recognize MGMA does have some good information as, as do the other surveys as to what is the training and experience. They have a separate survey for people who are brand new out of residency and it's their first time um, being on their own. So for, you know, they have new provider compensation surveys. So, and they also break things out by the level of training and experience from, you know, how long have you been practicing medicine? But a lot of things you can't just get from the survey, such as what are the provider specific duties and responsibilities that they have in that organization, right? Do they have a medical directorship that they do? Do they have an administrative role? Are they practicing as a physician as well as being the CMO? Are they, you know, are they in the family practice clinic as we have in so many rural um, hospitals and the hospital doesn't have a hospitalist program so that primary care provider is actually going to the hospital to do rounding then going to clinic and then going and doing rounding again before they go home. So it's not just so part of that is those duties and responsibilities might not always line up compared to another hospital where they do have a hospital's program and the primary care provider is purely in the clinic and they never have to step foot in the hospital except for you know when we're having employee appreciation pizza day. And you know, so looking at that kind of piece, it's also what is the community need? An organization where you have wait times to get a new patient into primary care um, that is, you know, three months long is significantly different than an organization where we can get you where we have same day appointments and we can get a new uh, new patient visit into established primary care within the within one week. Those are very different community needs. You might have a very high disease incident rate of some specific disease. If you have a very high COPD population, you might need access to providers that an organ that um, somewhere that doesn't. If you have a very high obesity rate, if you have, um, for, for example, if you're a provider who is an emergency department provider, what level trauma center are you working in? Are you getting regular gunshot wounds? Um, which, by the way, in rural, I know that's an example that um, we hear about all the time at conferences about fair market value. But in rural, keep in mind, a lot of us do have to deal with gunshot wounds because we you know, of hunting season, which I have learned that, you know, it's not always the best example when you're presenting in rural is I have to tell lawyers being like, don't use that example. We still have gunshot wounds in rural um, sometimes. You know, so you need to be able to look at that, those kinds of pieces. But you might, do you have, are you a center of excellence for stroke? Oftentimes we don't really have that in critical access hospitals. So maybe our um, need for a neurologist might not be as high because we know that we transfer all of those patients out. You also have to think about what is the overall community benefit um, and how does that a provider living in the community that becomes part of that community that they become you know, in, ingrained in there actually does have a significant benefit that we've seen than a provider that commutes in from hours away right, establishing um, a provider and their family in rural, you can actually pay them more for that because it is, it is considered part of retention, right? Somebody who will, a uh, provider who will move to your community, set up their family and become part of that community, be part of the PTA and et cetera, and actually is ingrained that all, you know, all their patients are seeing them in the grocery store and at the bank and the post office is somebody who is less likely to leave a community than somebody who is commuting in from hours away and, and, and isn't living there. It's also, is the provider from the community? We see much higher retention for providers going back home to either where they are originally from, where they have extensive family and where they trained, as opposed to a community that they don't have those tethering times to. It's also important to look at what the overall time it takes to recruit a provider. So if a provider, if you've had an open position, for a year and it's and no bites whatsoever. Well, maybe you need to adjust what the compensation level is that you're offering for the position. Um, recognizing that we still have to probably you need to revisit the business case 
as to is this going to be a financially feasible service that we're going to offer if we're trying to recruit a psychiatrist and our pro forma tells us it's going to bring, you know, this is the business case to be able to afford and prop up a psychiatry clinic. And now we have to increase the compensation. Does the pro forma still work? So, and then you also have to keep in mind the compensation methodology and amount, right? So if you have a very rich, I mentioned for this specific client, they do have a rich benefits package. Um, I think I actually talked to them about employment one time. <laughs> so of being like, okay, your retirement match is probably the one of the best that I've ever seen in the country. But they all, but they also had pieces of benefits that not every provider was ever going to take access to. So they had a very generous package with regards to continuing education of that it was it was eligible for anybody in their organization. And so, but providers weren't necessarily going to take advantage of it where they paid for you to go back to school. So if a nurse wants to become a nurse practitioner, the organization would pay for it, especially if they would come back and, you know, they had to come back and make sure they worked after they finished their nurse practitioner. And then it was different if they continued to work and then basically did the schooling and, um, during their time off or, you know, during the night if they um, were doing that. But a physician isn't likely to necessarily take advantage of some of those benefits. So you have to look at remuneration in its totality. How much of it is base salary and at risk versus, you know, if you're doing a productivity incentive or if you're doing quality benefits, you know, things that are at risk can be looked at differently than if it's all guaranteed compensation, right? If you know you're getting that compensation regardless of what you do that year, um, how you know, and how you perform at your job, it look is it looked at differently than okay I could make this amount but it's not guaranteed and so that's a really important thing to think about when you're what's fair market value. So Opal, um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with how you work quality incentives into provider comp, but could you maybe give an example of how you could incorporate like the community benefit component into compensation? Yeah, because that's a different one. Like, I, I think a lot of people don't think about putting that into their compensation. Right. A lot of people think, um, I think I will say most people look at com these factors as, okay, here's how we justify it on the back end as far as why we did it. But one of the things that I've seen that I, you know, we definitely think is appropriate is if you have, say you have bands of compensation for your organization within a specialty, right? Of say your family practice provider you know that you're going to offer somewhere between 200 and 240, right? You might say, okay, everybody starts at 200, but we're going to give you a certain amount or a percentage increase for being a part of the community. So if, you know, if you're local, then you can be, then we're going to go ahead and put you in the middle of that band by giving you an additional 10%. So that goes from 200 to 220 now, right? Like as an, uh, as, as an automatic, because we know, that that be you being part of that community is going to be another big one is rural experience. It is very different providing medicine in a rural community than it is in an urban center, especially like you think about the hospitalists in the emergency department, which were two of the specialties that were very significant for us to look at in this in um, with this organization, because they don't have access to the same specialist. Right. They had to have the experience of like, listen, I don't have a GI to call. I don't have a general surgeon who is also on call, if somebody presents in the emergency department this, I've got to figure this out, or I'm going to be transferring them, and we're not going to continue to provide care locally, as opposed to maybe in a more urban setting where they have so many, you know, on the one hand, they have a much higher volume of patients, they also have an entire team to rely on for that care of the patient. So there's, you know, that having that rural experience also creates some stickiness is the way that I like to call it for the provider. If you're trying to recruit a provider in, and they worked in rural before, trust me, I'm going to pay that provider more because I know that they're not going to leave one year in saying, wait a minute, you don't have specialists for me to call. Like that's, that's a really big one. And so that's another way that you can incorporate into your compensation strategy is say, okay, if you have at least five years of rural experience, so I know that this, that we're not going to be a shock to you, I'm going to go ahead and increase whatever the our base pay that we set and say and say you set your base the 25th percentile of MGMA. Like we know that that's we're not going to be able to get anybody for cheaper than that no matter what the level of work is. We're going to do an automatic, you know, 10% increase for anybody who has at least 5 years of rural expertise. Now, one of the things you have to be really careful about of setting a compensation strategy that directly ties an increase for something like community benefit 
is to make sure that you're paying attention um, to, to a, couple, a couple of things. But one is to make sure it's not something that's already reflected in what how you came up with the base. So if you use survey data like MGMA and you use one of your pieces of saying, okay, we're going to base it off of Nash, MGMA national median. Well, national's everybody. And so it may be appropriate to apply a premium for rural experience because you know that most of the providers who have responded to MGMA are not rural. And so that that premium of no, needing that kind of experience is probably not reflected as a greater portion of that compensation that is reflected in the survey data. However, if you switch it to say, no, we're going to use MGMA rural median. Well, now are you double counting because that's already reflected? into the data that you're using as a starting point. So I think it's really great when organizations want to come up with a creative way to put in things that are going to specifically benefit their community that have nothing to do with the value or volume of referrals, right? But it have to do with retention, turnover, efficiencies, you know, exp that kind of experience. But you need to make sure you're not double counting something that's already being reflected elsewhere. So, yeah, go ahead. Susie. Well, as I say, what I love about this is, right, this is a real opportunity for the organization to identify um, things that are going to align with the mission and the vision of the organization and integrating the provider compensation with that mission and vision. I mean, to me, that's the really cool piece of this and really is, an, is a good opportunity for those organizations to try to drive uh, mission into the compensation system. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that breaks my heart is when I hear um, when I'm when I'm helping a pro, um, organization with provider recruitment, and they're interviewing somebody, and the very first words out of the CEO's mouth are, "I'm so sorry. I know we don't have access to X, Y, and Z for you. You know, because we're rural." Et cetera. I'm like, "No, don't start the apology tour. Like, talk about why it would be amazing to work for your organization. Why it's awesome to work in rural, um, and and talk about how." hey, the things that are amazing about working in a rural, we put that into our compensation. You're going to get paid more for all the reasons that it's amazing and awesome to work in rural and why this is going to be a wonderful organization for you if you meet these types of criteria because this is what we value. We know that if you have this, you know, people do interviews all the time now. And they're like, tell me what will make me the most successful here. How do you define success? And having being able to have that conversation with a provider in a way that aligns with your organizational mission that says, here's who we are, and we're proud of who we are and the service that we provide. And, and we even incorporate that in your to compensation. That's such a huge message to have across your organization and to being able to bring people in as opposed to the apology tour, you know, and saying, oh, we're sorry, rural doesn't have X, Y, and right. Z. And so this is such an important conversation, too, when we're talking about provider burnout right, is trying to engage providers in the mission of the organization. And this yeah. is a, another tool to do that. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things that actually came up in a recent conversation was actually the community benefit of maybe having providers, you know, we, we learned this through COVID where we asked providers to go and set up the COVID clinic or, you know, some, or, and historically I'd seen it with outreach clinics and such, but what if you were having, okay, you want your, you to be out more in the community what if the provider is, the, you know, you have an initiative saying, okay, providers, it's separate from good citizenship, but we want you to participate in the community. If we're going to do outreach at the fair at the farmers market, all every Saturday, all summer long, we need somebody to be basically give, giving flu shots, you know, for um, in that year, and we're we're giving free flu shots, and it's out there being in the community. Yep. So you know, you're not going to pay them per flu shot, but saying okay, this is outside of your clinic hours. If you participate in these types of initiatives that are really important, you're going to do all the wellness fairs for at the school, right? I mean, those are things that if that's part of your organization, let's figure out how to put those things into compensation strategy. Love it. So we want to talk a little bit about, so with this engagement, what is the compensation strategy process? Okay. And I have these pieces um, in here, this process, this flowchart that we follow, you know, actually for a specific reason of thinking about the time it takes, because I will tell you right now, if you think a compensation strategy engagement is 30 days, as we say where I live in Nashville, bless your heart, it, it's, it, is not, um, it is not a 30 day, it's not a 90 day engagement if you want to do it right. There's a lot of stuff that's, you know, 
you do up front. There's data collection that's going on. We review the data and the analysis. We're going to have a kickoff call with leadership to say, okay, here's what we're seeing. You know, here's our current assessment of where you guys really are at compensation today. Um, here, you know, and one of the things that I think is really important is we put together a provider compensation committee. So it's important to have, if you're developing a compensation strategy, I, in my experience, it does not work well if it is just a top down to have a CEO download a best practices checklist and say, here's our new compensation, you know, um, sign this new contract. That doesn't tend to go very well. The, um, you know, it's definitely not a shared governance model. And with this client, we really had to look at, it was their very first time doing any sort of shared governance model where they were going to have the providers. They're like, Hey, this is our organizational culture. Now providers, we want to have one of our big goals through this engagement is to create transparency so that providers understand how they're getting paid and they have a say in it. So we put together a provider compensation committee, and that's something that's going to be ongoing for that organization. It's not just to do this compensation strategy process. Having some sort of provider action council or provider comp committee that meets, you know, even after the engagement's over four times a year to address things that aren't just clinical quality pieces is a really important thing for having overall engagement with your providers and addressing the burnout and addressing the issues of how they should work really well with administration. It's, it makes it so much more successful we've seen for organizations that will engage in something like that. They had to make sure that the providers were educated about what was going on. Because as Stacy mentioned, those laws that she was mentioning, those like little metric things, they apply not just to the organization, they apply the providers have liability. If you receive the compensation for that, that's part of that relationship, you have personal liability for doing that. It's not just the hospital that will get in trouble for writing a provider a big fat paycheck um, with no logic behind it, right? That has nothing to do with fair market value. It's the provider themselves. So making sure that the providers were well educated. We did interviews with the providers to understand what are the things that they value? What are the different pieces that they think it's worth paying a provider extra for? You know, uh, it's really important to understand. So that's how you get to know the unique aspects of your organization. Some organizations really value tenure. Some of them don't. They're like, I don't care how long you've been here. I care how well, how hard you work and how well you work. Doesn't matter if you've been here for two years, you know, two years versus 20 years. So with, with that, we pulled all this information together and we came up with a conceptual outline for it. So all of that actually happened relatively quickly. And that and it and it and it usually does, like because it's all really under our control, right? That's that part is usually done on the back end. We can get it done in 60 days, you know, hey, that that part is, that's great. But then here comes in actually the strategy development and proposing a straw man. And I always like to use the word a straw man strategy because one of the really, really important things about provider compensation is that you are doing what's best for the organization and the providers, not what an individual. Any strategy that is driven by making sure one individual or one specific specialty is maximized is not compensation strategy. Like that, that is not going to work. So if you're if you see, if you have the person on provider compensation committee who's raising their, who is skipping off gleefully, super, super excited, that should be a little bit of a red flag as to, you know, wait a minute, does this, does this strategy benefit? There's fair compensation. There's not a happy comp, there's no such thing as happy compensation. There's fair compensation. So, um, and then here, like strong that that strategy and model development takes time, and it's really important to involve your board and give them education here. And then you're actually going to work with that provider compensate. It's an iterative process. We're going to go and we propose this straw man, and guess what? The providers are going to tear it apart. They're not going to like anything. I promise you. The very first time you present it to them, they're not going to like anything. And you have to keep the board educated throughout that entire piece of it where you're really working on this co-creation of, and it might be multiple meetings. It might be if, depending on if it's a tweak versus a start from scratch or a huge overhaul to compensation strategy can develop how big, you know, how long each of these things are going to take. So you want to keep your board regularly updated as you're going through this process of where are things, what are the things that are coming up because they're going to get approached by their providers. And one of the very first things that's going to come up oftentimes once you've done that straw man strategy model development is they're going to go to the board and say, like, you guys just did this engagement to cut my compensation. That's the only reason why you guys are doing that. And the board needs to be prepared for those questions and those types of comments um, and understand what's going on of like, why are we putting this? Because until you actually get the whole thing, the iterative process complete, 
of what is our strategy. And then the board needs to take action of passing that strategy until you are there. There's always going to be, okay, this was proposed, which would have a negative impact on this provider's compensation. There rarely is a situation where you're going to come up with, hey, everybody's going to come across as super happy and be completely whole on that. But one of the big pieces is then you go into implementation, right? It's oftentimes it's going to be a process. You never do, okay, here's our new strategy. It goes live tomorrow. Stacy's drafted your new contract. Here you go, sign it. You have to have, there's going to be an implementation timeline because again, compensation is about paying people to get them to do what you want them to do. It's about behavioral change. And so the providers have to, if we adopt this compensation strategy that has all these different components in it, such as a quality incentive for the first time, well, then you're going to have to have time where you pay the provider the way they're getting paid, but they have time to understand, okay, here's how it's changing and here how here is how that gets layered in. It's not an overnight piece. Um, is really important. And oh, well, I it might be interesting for you to talk about. I, th I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about the project that you and I worked on most recently is that it what this the project ended up not just being uh, here's your new compensation system, right? There was the need to develop an operational plan that would help support the new compensation system. Do you want to just talk about that for a minute? Because I think that's important to keep in mind and can also dramatically lengthen the time frame that it's going to take to get this project completed. Yes, absolutely. So the operational piece is really, really important because understanding what people value is, imp is really important because some people um, in this specific project you know, there, there was a lot of people who really liked the flexibility. For example, the emergency department providers liked 24 hour shifts. They wanted, they prefer to be on for 24 hours and then be able to be off for the next three days, right? So they were only doing so many 24 hours instead of doing 12 hour shifts. And so um, if they wanted that, but the advanced pra and they brought on an advanced practice provider during very high volume pieces to back up that emergency department provider. And the APPs want to change what their shifts look like of like, okay, well, they do 12 hour shifts. And based off of, hey, we would rather, if we wanna keep our compensation whole, um, you know, some of the different pieces, how would that might change what their shifts look like? Um, do they, were they going to switch instead of just doing, you know, three 12 hour shifts, now they were wanting to switch to doing five eight hour shifts. And how does that impact the physicians who were used to doing a 24 hour shift and are like, wait a minute, I'm only gonna have an APP here helping me out for eight hours a day instead of 12. That's a significant change. That's an operational piece. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to impact compensation, but in this case, it very much was. Some of the things that the providers were saying were important to them from especially a flexibility standpoint, because again, it's not one of the new things that we're seeing in the past three years of an increasing rate it's not just about the W-2. The providers care about their lifestyle. They're burned out from COVID. They want to be engaged, but, you know, so they want to say in this and they are, they're looking for how can we rebalance our lifestyle, but not take big, pay, you know, don't get me wrong. They don't want, nobody wants to take a big pay cut in order to have that lifestyle balance. And so what are the operational pieces that need to be layering on? And in this case, we actually had to have a large conversation about the operations of the nursing staff and what training that they might need and what protocols might need to be put in place in order to make operational changes feasible to fit with a new compensation strategy. Um, and so one of the big things that we said for fair market value is that with this client, compensation had been divorced from what really the job description and the volume and um, anything we had been. Now, again, you're not talking about compensating for the um, val you know for the value of the referrals or the volume of patients that people are seeing but you're thinking about what are the duties and responsibilities you cannot pay a provider at the 90th percentile to see two patients a day that you know are just a level above a nurse visit right like that's not the services rendered are not the same as what you see at the 90th percentile who might be completely overwhelmed with nonstop patients um, you know, and, um, and, and super, super high quality. So while those are, while those things, you don't pay for the volume of um, patients, you do say, what is the overall job description? And it's a big red flag from a fair market value station when you see a huge gap. So if you're compensating somebody 
at the, you know, at the 80th, I'm going to use extreme examples here at the 90th percentile, but they're only doing the 10th percentile. That's like, wait a minute, why? Like, why is it, why are comp and services so, so far removed from one another? That, that would be a big red flag. And so if that, if it were that situation, you think about, all right, how do we close that gap? Well, obviously you're not going to just give somebody a pay cut all the way down to the 10th percentile. Right. So you might look at what are, especially for like an ED or a hospitalist where it's shift based, you don't, you're not going to go and incentivize a provider to go out and hit people with their cars to drive up ED volumes or anything like that. So you have to take that into consideration of like, what is the overall services that they're providing? And so are there operation, if you do have a big gap, what are operational changes that you can make in order to close that gap? Right. Are there new services that you guys haven't been providing? You have the resources, you have the expertise. But for some reason, you haven't been ad providing that service. So do you need to have some operational changes to expand your wound care clinic or maybe an urgent care clinic, you know, after hours? Who's going to man that now? And, and how do you put that into compensation? And, and while I, I mean, one of the things I think about is interesting in, in this particular circumstance, while the operational planning piece of it really extends the time frame and the complexity of the project, it really is another opportunity to engage your providers. Again, this is a great way to incorporate them into the mission of the organization. It's one of the ways to address burnout. The other, from the lawyer part of me, this is also a great way to help prevent whistleblowers, right? People who are engaged in the organization and have been asked about how they can further the mission of the organization are much less likely to be like, I'm so unhappy that I think I need to file a False Claims Act case, right? So it has many collateral benefits. Um, I mean, not every compensation process is necessarily going to need this, but I think in this case where we were making significant changes and uh, you were going to raise issues with providers, this was a great way to integrate the providers into the discussions, get their feedback, Get them excited about what was happening um, as opposed to feeling like they're on the outside and the hospital was just all about money right we really we could take it and focus on mission and services that are being delivered and not just about compensation now one of the coolest things that i remember in one of the comp committee meetings that we had um, with this organization was actually hearing a physician say well listen i you know i i care more about key you know keeping the ape making sure that the APPs are treated fairly and that they're going to get enough shifts to keep hold because this organization did have a very strange structure um historically of how they set shifts so which I I give them credit for structuring shifts around people's lifestyle but they had very few 1.0 FTEs <laughs> they had people were like 0 0.71 0 0.53 like it was very very strange as to how they had like two APPs total in the organization that were actually considered full time um, based off of their structure. And so obviously you design compensation strategy around, okay, here's like, this is what compensation looks like for a 1.0 and you adjust based off of FTE status. And um, I, I definitely had not encountered, I, I mean, we hear part-time providers all the time, but I had never experienced this level of nobody being a 1.0. And so it was very hard with compensation strategy to have people being like yes but what how does this apply to me because I'm not you know like and ha like constantly having to do the math of being like all right here's what this strategy comes up with now like let's adjust it for everybody for 0.53 and so a physician in the meeting said listen why you know I would rather take shorter shifts and me not because the, a lot of the physicians were 1.0 to make to make sure the APPs have the opportunity to get the shifts that they need in and so to see physicians wanting to engage with the APPs and like show that mutual respect of saying, guess what, we're all pro like, we are providers taking care of this community. That, I mean, I really loved seeing that. And it was actually a provider who was relatively new to the organization. He hadn't been there that long. And to have that much care for his fellow providers, um, you know, really def and this is somebody who was not like, for an organization that was doing um, shared governance for the very first time in their history, to have somebody new to the organization step up and say, I care about everybody, like I'm willing to take, uh, you know, can we make an adjustment where I cut back a little bit 
and and for, and I'll go work on this different you know growth initiative that we're talking about. I'll take on this you know the some of this administrative work if it allows better uh, the APPs to meet the shifts that allow them the balance that they need for their you know for some of them that had young families. So I, I agree with you completely, Stacy, that it's really important for them to see how you know how this all balances out um, with that. So I do recognize that we only have about a minute left. That apologize that Stacy and I enjoyed talking to each other so much on this case um, and other and this project, and but didn't really leave much time for Q and A. If there is if there's in one, we can take probably one question. Um, and the question that's in there is about whether or not. I actually don't know the answer to this one, so we will get back to you about whether or not the um, you're eligible for CPE or CPA so to provide that kind of that certificate. So I will we will send that when we send out the recordings to everybody and get that access or at least get the answer hopefully by tomorrow's opening session as to whether or not people have access to CPs. So with that, Stacy and I thank you um, would like to thank you for joining us today. Here's our contact information if you have any additional questions that you might want to ask us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wade, my colleague Wade Gallon, who is going to be talking to you. So we spent time on legal. Now you guys get to talk about money and the cost report. So thank you, Stacey, so much Thanks. for joining me today for this conversation. Thank you, Opal, for that introduction. Moving from one good topic to another, we're going to talk about the finances here, specifically the cost report. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all and to jump in to really a presentation on best practices as we see it here at Stroudwater and then reimbursement opportunities. Um, for my background, you know, I, I have a traditional kind of CPA reimbursement background and worked um, originally for a Medicare administrative contractor. So these are formerly known as fiscal intermediaries or FIs, and they're the ones that essentially oversee the Medicare administration for a given area, and they're the ones who are taking a look at your cost reports. So that gave me a really interesting perspective, kind of starting off in that space and then moving on to the provider setting um, with, uh, with a stint in consulting as well. Um, really getting both sides of the review of the cost report, some of the areas where our, our contractors are kind of focusing on in terms of audits, and then also the preparation side of cost reports. And then here at Stroudwater, largely helping hospitals review their cost report for opportunities or at least potential opportunities. Um, so we're going to jump in with that, make sure my screen's working. Um, so overview, we're going to go over critical access hospital reimbursement or, or cost-based reimbursement and just why this is all important that we talk about the cost report. Then we're going to jump into cost report preparation, some of the best practices that we see. Um, and it, it really is a, a mesh between really preparation and then review of your cost reports. And we're going to jump in and talk a little bit about some of the common reimbursement opportunities we see when we're reviewing cost reports with our clients and how you might be able to look at them in your own facility and potentially find some opportunities for additional dollars there. So jumping into cost-based reimbursement, I did want to set the stage here because why is it important we're talking about the Medicare cost report? It's incredibly important for our critical access hospitals, especially because these are the documents that will um, help Medicare determine our, our cost base rate going forward. And so what happens is you file your Medicare cost report generally about five months or so after your fiscal year end. And when you file that cost report, after all the work that goes into it, the Medicare administrative contractor takes a look and, you know, they might um, propose an adjustment or do some other um, checking. They want to make sure that everything looks accurate, that there are no what they call edits in the cost report, or at least some of the more serious ones, which are inconsistencies that need to be reconciled. Um, and then they're going to utilize that cost report once it's accepted to set your rates going forward for Medicare until they receive another filed cost report. Um, that's generally how it works. And, you know, as we're going through this, always take into consideration that there is a, a great deal of nuance here when we're talking about cost report best practices and opportunities. There is a lot of nuance, and so we just need to recognize that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to cost reporting, um, even for critical access hospitals that have that cost-based reimbursement built in. Um, so cost-based reimbursement, it's a mechanism by which critical access hospitals are reimbursed from Medicare, and in some cases, Medicaid. Um, they, they, it provides some advantages for hospitals, for example, financing capital projects, depreciation is often an allowable cost, which we'll, we'll delve into here in a little bit. 
that can be picked up. So it's a, a cash flow generator. Um, it partially helps hospitals when they're experiencing significant volume fluctuations because as you have fluctuations either downward or upward in, in volumes, um, you will experience changes in your, you know, your per diem rate, your, your outpatient uh, cost to charge ratios, your ancillary cost to charge ratios. It, they're gonna ebb and flow with your, with your volumes. And so it acts as a partial insulator um, to help you kind of maintain that, especially in situations with low volumes, which is why we see a lot of critical access hospitals in, in some of the most rural areas around the country, right? They're helpful to a degree when we have inherently low populations. And so they allow us to be reimbursed for our cost and not necessarily based on a strict, um, you know, a set amount per, per discharge or per day. And then, um, and then we have to compare that to cost. So you do get some insulation there. What cost-based reimbursement doesn't do is protect you from all financial woes and negate the need for prudent cost management strategies. Um, the Medicare cost report is really crucial, though, as I mentioned before, because it helps us set our rates going forward. And it makes it that much more important that we optimize our cost report wherever possible and that we're maintaining practices that help us to ensure we're filing these, these cost reports accurately and that we're making use of all the opportunities that are available. So as we jump into best practices, what, what the attempt here was to do, this is not a panacea. This isn't supposed to cover every single best practice for cost report preparation and review. This is supposed to highlight some of the areas where if you're following these uh, pretty well, it's going to result in a much better cost report product, we'll say. Um, so when you file your cost report, when you're looking at, do we file an interim cost report? If you keep these, these practices in mind and you are practicing them appropriately, um, they should really help you uh, as you look to maximize your cost report and your cost-based reimbursement. The first best practice we chose to emphasize really is your, your mapping. So there is something called the matching principle. Um, if you're a CPA or, or have experience in, in reimbursement, you'll kind of understand the matching principle essentially saying that on our Medicare cost report, the way it's structured is we report our costs, we report our gross charges, less the professional component. Um, and we wanna make sure that when we're reporting these, as well as our days and discharges and all that other information that we're appropriately matching. Um, so we wanna make sure that if we have revenues tied to the OR, right, that they're reported in that OR cost center uh, to match those expenses that are in our OR cost center. There's some nuance to that. You know, we're dealing with you know medical supplies and planables and that sort of thing, and there are different cost centers um, for some of these items. But the the goal is to really accurately reflect our costs and our revenues in the same bucket, so we can generate accurate cost to charge ratios and ensure our cost based reimbursement is is um, acceptable and it makes sense. So the potential issue here is that we have. Um, improper matching, which will impact our rates for Medicare. They'll impact them in all different types of ways. Sometimes we'll, you know, overstate, or sometimes we'll understate. Um, there's all different opportunities for misstatement there. And what the way hospitals generally, at least in, in my experience, do this is they utilize things like the trial balance and a revenue detail file of some kind. Maybe this will break it down by revenue code or charge code or both. Um, there's a number of different ways that uh, hospitals map revenues and expenses. And generally speaking, hospitals will utilize the Medicare Provider Statistical and Reimbursement Report, uh, otherwise referred to as the Medicare PSNR, although some hospitals do choose to utilize internal information to report their Medicare charges on the cost report. So there's all the different ways, and there's a lot of opportunity for there to be mismatching. As simple as it might sound to say we want to put all of our revenues associated with this particular area in cost center and then match them with our expenses. It can actually be a pretty tricky process um, for any hospital really, but even critical access hospitals, because we're dealing with different sources of information that were put together for different purposes, right? So the best practice here that we see is really reviewing your mappings. So again, these are your expense and revenue mappings on an annual basis at least. So you are required to file a cost report at least annually. Um, there, there are some Exceptions to that, for instance, if you experience a change in ownership or if you have some other scenarios uh, take place, you might have to file a short period cost report or a longer period cost report than a full year. Those are fairly rare. 
Um, generally speaking, you have to file a cost report annually and it'll be five months after your fiscal year end. So reviewing these mappings at least annually to make sure we're aligning things correctly is really crucial. Um, where this comes into place uh, practically is, you know, let's say we add on certain departments throughout the year, or there are changes in the way we're accounting for uh, something, um, those can be reflected uh, in our, our trial balance and our revenue detail files in those areas. And we it just requires some prudence, right? So are we reviewing these things at least at a high level? Oftentimes, very high level reviews can reveal inconsistencies and um, help us really prepare a more accurate cost report. The next best practice we wanted to touch on is really our overhead cost allocations. And this is actually going to be an opportunity we're going to touch on later in the presentation. But for those unfamiliar with the cost report and the way it treats certain costs, um, we have what's called overhead cost centers. And these um, there's maintenance in those uh, cost centers. There's administrative, you know, our accounting, our information services, our IT department. Um, we have, you know, our dietary staff. We have uh, any number housekeeping, any number of these overhead cost allocation, or I'm sorry, these overhead cost centers that the cost report forces us to step those down. Sometimes you're, you're referred to as a step down process, but they require us to allocate these overhead costs to the other non-overhead departments within the cost report, right? So these would be our adults and peds, our, our med surge, um, our ICU, if you have them, our OR, radiology, the whole, the whole gamut of non-overhead cost centers. And so, the potential issue we often see is that when we allocate overhead costs to our non-overhead departments, there are um, inconsistencies and there's also just no correlation between actual overhead resource use and the allocation methodology. And why? so why is this an issue? Well, if we have overhead costs that we are disproportionately allocating to one cost center over another, where we might receive a higher reimbursement in this other cost center, it can result in um, either in inappropriate reimbursement on either end of the spectrum, right? Either over, over um, reimbursement or uh, suboptimal reimbursement. So we need to be careful with that. Now, what we often hear is that, you know, Medicare has prescribed cost allocation methodologies, and this is very true. Medicare has certain uh, methodologies that they have put on the cost report. So if you were to uh, open up the cost report instructions, you would see that uh, we're supposed to allocate, for instance, our depreciation expense based on our square footage in the hospital. That's a prescribed cost allocation methodology. They have these for a number of different cost centers. But the thing that we, that I think folks are often not aware of is that there is an option to, to change these potentially. Now you have to work with your Medicare administrative contractor, but it is possible. There are certain, if you follow certain protocols and you work with your Medicare administrative contractor, you can in some instances change your cost allocation methodology. So what's a, what's a good example? You might wanna do that if it's determined to be financially advantageous or if you have determined that there is a better way to allocate overhead costs to these non-overhead departments. You have to receive formal MAC approval. You have to do this before you're filing your Medicare cost report. So it has to be well thought out and well coordinated, but it is a possibility. So, you know, best practice that we see is generally reviewing these at least annually. Again, when you file your cost reports at the very least, and then potentially throughout the year um, to the point about being able to adjust some of these, uh, looking at them even more frequently to figure out, okay, does this allocation methodology make sense? Does it, does it really, is it a true reflection of how overhead costs should be allocated for this given department? You know, does it pass the smell test in that sense? Um, so that's the best practice that we see there, but often very difficult to do because the cost report is, you know, we often see it's outsourced or if it's done internally, it's, it's kind of rushed through and we have the end of the year and it's a mad scramble. We get it done. We feel great. And then we move on, right? Um, it takes a very conscious effort to, to delve into these things. The next best practice is really related to the other two we've talked about. They're all related. So all these best practices are intertwined and they're not mutually exclusive. Another best practice we see is really tracking your settlement throughout the year. 
for a critical access hospital, your Medicare settlement. So they will, um, our Medicare traditional will uh, reimburse um, critical access hospitals based on the cost-based reimbursement methodology. And they also true up at the end of each of each year. So what I mean by that is it's very similar to our, our tax return on a personal level, right? You submit the amount of taxes that you paid throughout the year, you compare it to the tax that you should have paid. And then at the end of the year, it's determined you either have an amount due from the IRS or due to the IRS. Very similar with cost reports. Um, the Medicare will true up at the end of each year in that they'll compare what they have paid to the hospital to the allowable cost according to the filed Medicare cost report. And if there's a difference between the two, they're gonna settle up. So that could mean that the hospital either owes money to Medicare or the hospital is due money from Medicare, depending upon how it shakes out. Because of this, the settlement is really a moving target. And if we're, if we're prudently, um, if we're maintaining financial prudence in management of the critical access hospital, we need to have a sense of what that is at the year end. Um, the potential issue is that we have a huge surprise at the year end, whether it's a significant amount due from Medicare or a significant amount due to Medicare. Now, you might look at it and say a significant amount due to Medicare is far worse than a significant um, receivable from Medicare at the end of the year. Um, and that might there might be some validity to that statement. But the challenge is, even if we're expecting a significant receivable from Medicare, you know, if we think back to taxes, right, uh, similar to our tax return, if we have a huge amount that's due to us, then that's cash that we could have utilized throughout the year for other purposes, right? But instead, it's been held on by Medicare throughout the year. So it, it's not so much a one is bad and the other is good. Um, it's more we shouldn't have any surprises at the very least. And we should seek to, to maximize what we're being paid currently because the other thing that happens is our Medicare Advantage plans generally do not go through the same true up process that Medicare does. So they, they are supposed to, again, unless you have some sort of direct contract with a plan, they're supposed to pay according to Medicare rates, traditional Medicare rates. So when you file the cost report, uh, another best practice that you should be doing is you know providing that cost report to your MA payers so that they pay in accordance with your Medicare traditional rates. Now, because they don't true up at the end of the at the end of the year, if we're seeing this significant receivable build and build and build throughout the year from traditional Medicare, that means that we really, in theory, should be paid a higher rate, and the Medicare Advantage plans are not paying us that. So we need to make sure that we are filing accordingly um, to to make sure that we're utilizing that, we're maximizing our reimbursement, and then um, you know the best practice here is really monitoring it throughout the year, using a developed model of which there are several out there. There are many different um, firms, you know, accounting firms, consulting firms that have models like this. And really developing thresholds where you say, okay, this is, once the settlement reaches a certain point, this is advantageous for us to file an interim cost report. Um, so that way we can, again, take advantage of our Medicare Advantage payer reimbursement. And, and if there's significant cash that we could be using now, we want to make sure we have that and then cost report reviews, this again is very overarching, but really at the end of the day, what this relates to is having somebody objective who can review your cost report. Um, I've been in the cost report preparation side of things for quite some time. And you know, when you're in it, you are in the weeds. When you're preparing a cost report, you are looking at trial balance accounts and you are evaluating you know, related party transactions, you're looking at, uh, you know, provider compensation and whether or not, for instance, in the emergency department, we have any administrative time that we can be including as allowable costs. There are just, <laughs> there are so many areas, right? Are there other income items we need to be offsetting on our worksheet A8? There's so many nuances and complexities. Um, there's a number of calculations that occur way more than you know, the human brain could probably process all in one, in one fell swoop, but, and there's a lot of regulatory references and nuances there. So we really need to be making sure that um, we get a multi-tiered review process in place. Once we've kind of done all of the other pieces that we've described, we want to get that second look, that objective second look who can say, oh, well, it looks like you might've missed this, or is there any opportunity here? Um, and 
you know, we have some softwares that are out there that'll help you when preparing a cost report that will mitigate those risks of errors, but it's not really meant to look for opportunities there, right? So we just want to make sure that we have this multi-tiered review process in place before filing, and then also looking into some sort of objective review after filing as well. And uh, this is a slide I, I like to show. This is your worksheet S of the Medicare cost report, and it estimates that the total number of uh, hours to complete the cost report is roughly 674. And I'll let those who have prepared the cost report, you know, think about that or, or compare it to their own experience. It's a huge project. Um, and when you, uh, what I don't show here in the slide is there's a signature line where somebody at the hospital needs to sign up on this cost report. And when you sign off, what you're saying is you attest to the accuracy of the information in the report. Um, and this, this is a federal document. Again, it's really important that we take this seriously, that, you know, the cost report isn't just something to put off towards the year end. And we, you know, rush to get it done and we get it done and we don't evaluate it. It's a really important um, document for us to, to look at and to prepare accurately. So with that, we're gonna jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities we see. I've selected five. Um, Stroudwater does a number of cost support reviews for hospitals all around the country with a particular focus on critical access hospitals. And these are some of the opportunities that we commonly see. These might not apply to your facility. Maybe you have some of these things locked down and you, you evaluated them, you have done your due diligence. But in a lot of cases, right, it's just having somebody who can provide that outside view will be helpful. And maybe some of this you will, re will resonate with you or you can relate to if you're on that cost report review side. The first opportunity is our Medicare bad debts. Um, so the general principle is, you know, according to federal regulations, the costs attributable to deductible and coinsurance amounts. So these are our patient responsibility amounts for our traditional Medicare patients. If they're unpaid um, during the fiscal period that you are filing the cost report for, they can be claimed as allowable cost. And what Medicare will do is they'll take a look and they'll reimburse you 65% of the allowable Medicare bad debt total. So they're going to take a look at this. You have to maintain a detailed listing. You have to abide by a number of different uh, rules in order to claim these bad debts. But Medicare will reimburse you 65% of those allowable bad debts if you claim them and if you're able to uh, prove them out once they audit those. The opportunity we generally see is that hospitals aren't maintaining ac adequate documentation and might be under underrepresenting their Medicare bad debt totals on their cost report, or there may be opportunity for them to claim additional bad debts, but because they might have claims held up in a collection agency, or they just they for whatever other reason they are not filing these, it can reduce your reimbursement or at least not allow you to capture uh, optimal reimbursement. And for some of these things, you have to you have to claim them in the time when a bad debt is considered um, bad debt, essentially, or when it's determined to be uncollectible. Um, so a slight difference there. It's not bad debt from an accounting perspective. It's when the claim is actually considered uncollectible. But it's it's not one of those things where you can then go back the next year and say, oh wait, well we missed this in last year, so let's just claim it in this year. You have to claim it in the year it was considered uncollectible. And if you don't, then there's opportunity for amending and some of that, but it's really important that we track this because often providers will miss this. This is showing the, just on the cost report where you expect to find allowable bad debts. This is talking about the, the part A side of it where um, you know on your worksheet E-3 part five, you've got allowable bad debts. Your line 25 is where you report a total amount. And then that's multiplied by 65 to get to the amount on line 26, which is what you're actually reimbursed. And then you need to claim dual eligible bad debts, your Medicare and Medicaid bad debts on line 27. That amount is included in line 25, but they are looked at differently by our Medicare administrative contractors. So one bad debt is not the same as another bad debt. You have to be really careful with that. And this is just on the Part B side. The solution, we got to make sure we're properly tracking our bad debts, bringing them back from our collection agencies if we utilize that, preparing our bad debt listings in the prescribed format, and ensuring proper documentation is maintained. Overhead costs, we, we touched on this quite a bit. So 
I will just say that the general principle is you have to have uh, a method of cost finding on the cost report. This goes back to our cost allocation discussion earlier. And you have to, you have to be able to substantiate that, right? So the opportunity we see again is that we're not using the best allocation methodology all the time. And if we, if we were to evaluate it, we might find opportunities to enhance our reimbursement because it would result in costs going into a higher cost-based bucket or cost center on the Medicare cost report. We also have issues of double counting, exclusion of information, that sort of thing that we need to be mindful of. So the solution, and I didn't include the cost report worksheet because if you've looked at a worksheet B-1, B part one, B part two, you'll see, you'll know it's kind of a bear to look at and a little challenging to put on one screen. Um, but the solution here is really making sure that we review these on a consistent basis as I talked about earlier. Related party costs, this is one that has come up a lot recently because we have critical access hospitals that are more frequently becoming part of larger systems. So what'll happen is if you have a related party and they're providing some sort of service and you're, you're paying for that service, the cost report wants to true up to what's the allowable cost. So oftentimes healthcare systems will prepare a home office cost statement that they'll utilize to allocate um, the corporate kind of the home office expenses to all the entities within their organization. So if you are a critical access hospital and you are a part of that, of a healthcare organization, you really wanna make sure you understand how they're allocating home office costs to you. Generally, there's some sort of related party transaction that occurs. Maybe you, there's a management fee baked into your trial balance that you have to compare to overhead, or I'm sorry, um, home office costs that are allocated to you. Um, oftentimes health systems don't really understand the cost-based reimbursement side for critical access hospitals, and they might not understand the importance of maximizing even their home office cost statement and what that might mean for overall system-wide reimbursement, right? It's thinking system uh, strategically from a system perspective, not from any one particular hospital's perspective. So again, the, the solution to this that we see is really working with the related party organization, say the healthcare um, facility, healthcare system, to ensure our cost allocations are reasonable and that they make sense. And this is a worksheet A-8-1 where these would be reported. In column five, it shows the amount that um, we, we included on our trial balance. So this would be the equivalent of say a management fee. Um, and then in column four is where we report the actual allowable cost, the cost coming from the related party organization. Again, Medicare will look at the two and if allowable costs, the amount of cost allocated is greater than the amount paid out, then there'll be a positive adjustment and the reverse is also true. Position standby on-call costs in the ED department. This is one where we've actually seen quite a bit of work in the, the industry, the cost report industry, because providers have picked up on this. So if you have providers in your emergency department, but they're not spending time dedicated to patient care, um, the cost report will allow you to claim component of that. On your Medicare cost report, it'll flow through as allowable costs. And it'll be in included in your rate. Now, what we often find is that when we, when we look at it and when we measure how much time they are, uh, critical access hospitals are claiming their providers spend per ED visit in patient care, it appears to be really overstated. And so the risk there is that we're receiving suboptimal reimbursement. Um, the solution to this is generally either a time study based system, or there have been companies that have come up with electronic uh, time tracking systems that can help us really maximize this component of the cost report. So there are resources available, but again, it's to help increase that allowable cost, make sure that we're getting paid appropriately. And this is A82, where you would see that play out. I've highlighted that again, you're gonna receive the slides afterwards. So I'm just gonna go right through here. The, and then the last one we've identified here is really our reporting for provider-based RHCs. Basically they are paid a certain all-inclusive rate. And this is based on the total allowable cost divided by the RHC visits that are recorded. Essentially, if you are um, reporting visits that are below a certain productivity amount that the cost report calculates, then the cost report will utilize the, the productivity count that the cost report calculates instead of your actual visits. And this can really hurt your reimbursement if you have um, uh, non-productive or 
uh, providers that aren't meeting the productivity standards in the cost report, but also we find that there's information that's misreported here. You're tracking non-RHC visits in the total visit count, or you're tracking, um, you know, provider FTEs that are not truly dedicated to the RHC services outlined in, in regulation. And so it's really important for us to be reviewing this consistently. This is, again, where it plays out on the cost report. The solution we see here at Stratowater is really making sure we're reviewing our provider-based RHCs for accuracy, ensuring that our FTEs and visit counts are accurate and that they represent true RHC services. Um, and we got to make sure that our non-RHC services are being appropriately removed. And with that, I um, just want to thank you all for that time. I know we're right at time here. And so if there are any questions, folks can feel free to enter them at this point. We might have time for a couple. Um, And I'm, I'm not seeing any at the moment. Um, so with that, so this concludes our, our conference for today. We just wanna thank everybody for attending and just want you to be aware that we um, are committed to providing that high quality learning experience. You will receive a, a survey after this, after you exit the webinar, and we really encourage you to, to fill it out so that way we can learn how to improve in future conferences. Um, Thank you all for your participation here and look forward to uh, hopefully talking to you all again soon.